nuclear talks go down to the wire, reports emerge of a tentative agreement on parts of a deal through Iranian diplomats denied. The Saudi Arabia-led coalition in a fourth night of airstrikes on Shiite rebels in Yemen while in Egypt. A summit of Arab leaders confirmed the attacks will continue until the rebels surrender. And France votes in a second round with ruling socialists set for major setback and all eyes on the rise of the far right. Today with Lucy Aharish. Good evening and welcome to the news today. Two days before the deadline for a nuclear deal with Iran, Western diplomats have been quoted saying that parties have reached agreement on parts of a deal, but a senior Iranian negotiator has since denied a deal has been reached, stressing that several issues remain unresolved. Among the sticking points are how long the agreement itself would last, Iran's research of advanced centrifuges, and of course, sanctions. Outside of Lausanne, Switzerland, White House Press Secretary Josh, Josh Ernest challenged Iran to live up to their rhetoric and strike a deal, while Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu issued another warning over the talks, this time saying that the emergent agreement is even worse than Israel feared. We will look at the negotiations and the implications, but first, let's take a look back. I think that we can find solutions that are good for all, that can guarantee that uh, Iran has no uh, nuclear weapons, cannot develop nuclear weapons. Atsir, Iran, Luzan, Teman, Mesukan, Meod, Lainushut, and Zakhlan Zorin. The Yemeni is not only the Houthis and the Abdullah Saleh and Iran. We are going to continue. عملية عاصمة الحزم حتى تتحقق هذه الأهداف. ما حملة هوائية جنگنده های خارجی به مناطقی در یمن رو نقض تمامیت ارزی این کشور. Yes, and with me in the studio now are senior Middle East analyst Avi Sakhalov. Good evening. Thank you Good very evening, much for coming. We'll and Dr. Eldad Pardo, Iran expert at the Hebrew University and Impact SE. Good evening. Thank you very much. Um, Glad to be here. So uh, let's uh, start. Will it or will it not? Because uh, we talked a lot about the agreement that will be, but uh, it seems that this time it's for real. Well, anyway, it's a draft agreement, and if you ever try to purchase a house with a draft agreement, uh, you know, you don't sign. A a a any lawyer will tell Except you, don't, Israel, you know. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't sign a, a, a draft agreement, and, uh, you know, the deadline is uh, June 30th, and uh, in two days we are supposed to have a kind of, of a symbolic uh, deadline, so whether they are going to issue a piece of paper or not is not that relevant. What is relevant is the rapprochement between the United States on the one hand and Iran on the other. Uh, we heard from an Iranian defector that the U.S. is pushing hard over its allies, uh, France and, you know, all, 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 all this five and, and plus uh, group. We see Iran behaving across the Middle East like a loose cannon. And uh, we know that Iran is going through a major crisis, economic and transition of power. And uh, nobody take advantage of this weakness. You know, just uh, from this point that Iran is going like a loose cannon in the Middle East, how it can afford itself to actually put some you know, uh, some uh, statements on the table and say, I want this, but I don't want that. How come they are, the United States is not falling back and basically saying, telling them, no, this deal is not good? You ask why, the answer is because they can, because there's no one to stop them over there in the U.S., in the international community, and the opposite is, is what is happening. All the time that Iran is continuing with this huge operations all over the Middle East, supporting the Houthis, supporting Hezbollah, supporting the Iraqi militias, the Shiite Iraqi militias. It seems like the international community is pushing more and more aggressively, 
in order to sign an agreement with the Iranians and not the opposite. But when you're saying the international community, it seems that more the United States is pushing than the other countries that maybe starts to understand that Iran is not uh, a healthy thing to the Middle East. I'm not, you know, everyone understands that it's not, they're not that healthy. But I guess that what the Americans are trying to do, the administration is trying to, to define which sickness is worse, meaning maybe we should do, deal with the nuclear threat and then after that, you know, the, the revolutions or the, the coup attempts in Yemen and in other places, it's, worse of, it's, it's less worse of a threat for the Middle East or for the future of the Middle East. In a way, they're right, by the way. In a way, even the agreement, this coming agreement, although Netanyahu describes it as the worst thing ever, blah, 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 I think that it's better than the non-agreement, which will mean that they're continuing on towards the nuclear project. I mean, if you go back to the starting point of the negotiations, they were closer to a nuclear bomb comparing to the situation where they are today or even after the agreement. So before we will continue in I-24 News correspondent, Shai Ben-Ari looks at the latest developments from the talks in Lausanne. As the hours tick away, Tuesday night's deadline for a framework deal on the Iranian nuclear program inches ever closer, with marathon talks expected until the last minute. We have never been uh, so close to a deal. Still, we have uh, some critical points that uh, need to be solved, and we will work in these uh, hours over the weekend uh, to try to bridge uh, the gaps. On Sunday, reports said the Iranians have indicated a willingness to accept less than 6,000 nuclear centrifuges, as well as transferring most of its enriched uranium stockpiles to Russia. However, this was quickly denied by Iranian representatives as journalistic speculation. Western powers were said to be considering allowing Iran to conduct closely monitored enrichment-related medical work at the Fordo facility, long suspected of being an element in a possible nuclear weapons program. Also, U.S. officials were quoted saying a reciprocal step-by-step -step approach has been agreed with Iran to any potential deal that may be signed. The foreign ministers of the P5-plus-1 countries have all now convened in Lausanne, Switzerland for this diplomatic high noon with Iranian representatives. Sunday's arrival of the Russian foreign minister especially serves to confirm for many that the talks are indeed serious. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has himself canceled his participation in an event in Boston Monday in honor of his late friend Ted Kennedy to stay in Lausanne. Sticking points that do remain at this stage include differences over limits on Iran's research and development of advanced centrifuges, as well as the length of the deal and the schedule of sanctions relief. With recent reports of tensions emerging between the U.S. and France, direct talks were held Saturday between Kerry and his French counterpart, Laurent Fabius, as well as between Fabius and the Iranian foreign minister, Mohammad Jawad Zarif. What is important is the content of the commitments which need to be made. But I also insist on the importance of the transparency of the mechanism and the control aspect so that we can ensure the commitments are respected. Zarif, for his part, conveyed his faith in the good intentions of the French and others. I see that Germany and France uh, are really serious about reaching an agreement and I hope we can all work together in order to reach that agreement because I know that the seriousness on our side is there. Some see this public display of optimism as a tactic meant to increase pressure on the West. There are those, however, who continue to warn against an impending breakthrough. Uh, this deal, as it appears to be emerging, bears out all our fears and even more than that. Many expect a framework deal to be reached at some point on Tuesday, though even if it is, the final details will only be ironed out in yet another period of negotiations, scheduled to last until June 30th. Thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Pardo, we are trying to understand maybe, maybe Benjamin Netanyahu was right, but the way that he did it was wrong, which is leading right now the United States to reach an agreement, whatever agreement that they can, although deep inside they know that this is not the way. Well, first of all, I'm not a political advisor and definitely not for Mr. Netanyahu. Uh, the, the goal of Israel, and uh, actually I think if looking back since 2002, Israel's strategy has been uh, throughout uh, pretty consistent, uh, talking about building a military option, which I don't know very much about that. But on the other hand, uh, information, education, talking in every forum. So uh, Netanyahu's speech is just one other occasion of Israeli explain, is explaining the, the program. I think uh, in, in world history, uh, this uh, uh, propaganda campaign or information campaign 
uh, will go down as one of the more, most successful. I think almost everybody on this planet knows about Iran nuclear project, about the, about the danger, and nobody will be a, a, able ever to say, I didn't know. Everybody knows, everybody must uh, uh, take care about this, and uh, that's it. Netanyahu is not the ruler of the world. He's just a politician, Israeli politician. What? <laughs> well, you know, when I'm trying to look at the current situation, we need to remind of ourselves the thing that I started to say before. Going back to the, the, the place that the negotiation started, they had the ability to, to get faster to a nuclear weapon comparing to the situation where they are today and even comparing to the situation where they will be after removing the sanctions, after there will be an agreement. So it's not that for Israel, or for the U.S., or for the Arabs even, it's better without a deal. It is what I think what Netanyahu is trying to do. And this is something that we need to understand. It's not that after this agreement, that's it. We're going to face a catastrophe. I think that what Netanyahu and the others are trying to do is to improve the, the, the negotiations, to improve the agreement that is being framed right now in but I'm really trying to understand the United States in this uh, point because we are seeing maybe the biggest sign that uh, um, the our world is giving right now the United States is that they are not supporting what Iran is doing in Yemen. They are basically going against when we are seeing the, seeing the led coalition uh, of Saudi Arabia in uh, Yemen. So the Arab countries are against. Israel is against. Why the United States is jeopardizing the relationship with Saudi Arabia and with Israel and going through with this deal? I don't know. I don't have an answer. I don't have a, a clever answer for that. I suspect that there's no real policy regarding the Middle East in the White House today or in the U.S. administration. I think that, you know, right now the president is obsessed about reaching an agreement with, uh, with Iran, although even him and the others understands that there will be some re implications here, very negative ones, if they will reach an agreement like that. Maybe they believe that uh, if there is an agreement, if we follow uh, what uh, Tom Friedman said many years ago, this uh, poisonous kiss, if there is a big hug between the United States and Iran, and Iran, the main raison d'etre of Iran, of this regime, is to, top, uh, to, 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 to push the U.S. out of the, of the Middle East and, and to replace the, the, the U.S. and to unite uh, the Middle East under Iranian hegemony. If the people of Iran see a, an agreement for 10, 15 years in which the United States and Iran are the best of friends, then all the raison d'etre of the regime uh, will be put on question. So maybe this is the American logic. I would say that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not so uh, likely to happen because uh, this naive. regime is extremely well organized. It, it is terrorizing uh, inside and outside uh, their people and across the Middle East. And uh, unless uh, some miracle happens uh, inside, uh, they are going to continue. They, they did it for uh, more, uh, almost, you know, three, uh, almost four decades now. Do so, Dr. Pardo, do you think that an agreement would be in favor of the Iranian regime? It's hard to tell because there are so many problems inside Iran, and w w let's as let's assume that you know the, the best wishes of the Iranians, they get the uh, sanctions relief and everything. Then they have to run their country, and they uh, and they are fighting across the Middle East, and and you have oil prices, and uh, and no excuse anymore. And then why this dictatorship? Why are you executing people? Why are, why aren't you letting uh, women singers sing? Why are you, why why are, are you doing all, 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 all this? Why are you giving all this trouble if you have no ideology whatsoever? It's a very corrupt uh, system uh, on 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 the top of it. On the other hand, they uh, proved so far that they are uh, ruthless, that they are very organized. It, it's a small group of people that is extremely well organized, assuming that they are going to have the nuclear weapons and assuming uh, that they are not going to just, you know, give up power. It's not, it's not, it, it, it's, I, I would say it's a, it, 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 it's a pretty risky business, you know, following such a policy. So uh, let's go uh, right now uh, to the phone. With us is uh, Michael Wilner, Washington Bureau Chief uh, for the Jerusalem Post. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm happy to. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Michael, uh, let's try uh, to 
maybe portray uh, some kind of a picture here. What, the people who are sitting right now, the P5 plus one and Iran, who are sitting right now on a round table, do you really want to tell me that they're totally disconnected from what is happening right now in the Middle East and from what Iran is doing in the Middle East? Uh, I want to step back for a second. Um, I'm obviously here in, uh, in Switzerland and I, I'm not going to characterize uh, how whether or not they're disconnected to what's going on in the Middle East, but I do. I will say that uh, each country seems to have a different view of exactly what would be best for the region. So it seems if you ask officials from France, uh, officials from the United States, certainly officials from Iran. So I, I think it depends who you ask. So uh, what is happening right now? Because we're getting like some contradicting reports. Are they on Tuesday going to get some kind of agree an agreement? Right. Uh, well, the expectation is, I was speaking with an Israel, uh, a U.S. official just a couple hours ago who said everyone can see a deal. The question remains if they're seeing the same deal. And there are issues that seem to be um, entrenched. Uh, some of those issues include research and development and the extent to which Iran will be able to, uh, to develop advanced centrifuges. Another issue is uh, the pace which UN uh, Security Council sanctions will be lifted under any deal. These are actually very big issues that are not resolved. Um, and the expectation is that they will be solved by the 31st, but extend the talk um, after that. Michael, uh, you know, we hear that Israel is um, obviously against this uh, deal. We see hmm. that uh, France is uh, saying that it's demanding more transparency in the nuclear program of Iran and more transparency in general from Iran. And on the other hand, we are seeing that the United States is going just like a horse, uh, you know, on a race to this deal. Who wants this deal more, the United States or Iran? That's a, that's a good question. I think, look, I think they equally want deals. I think the question becomes um, what deals do they want? And look, uh, you know, I'm sure if you were to be asking, uh, you know, the prime minister himself, Netanyahu, uh, do you want a deal? He will say, yes, I just really don't want this deal. So it does seem as if everyone wants a diplomatic solution to this. The question is uh, what kind of uh, deal to, does each party want? And there's no question that the, that the president of the United States wants a deal that he thinks um, will uh, will solve the nuclear crisis that's been ongoing for over a decade peacefully. And if you ask the German foreign minister who arrived in Lausanne yesterday, he said that he thinks that a nuclear agreement could bring calm to the region. So obviously, he has a, a perspective that's far. Uh, from from Netanyahu's position. So, yeah, maybe, um, maybe the Germans yeah, yeah. Uh, know uh, something that we don't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Michael Wilner, thank you very, very much uh, for this conversation uh, with us. Calm to the Middle East. Let's uh, let's try to look at the calm in the Middle East, uh, the calm atmosphere in the Middle East. We're seeing what is happening in Syria. We're seeing what is happening with IS. We're seeing what is happening uh, with um, uh, with Yemen and everything with the terror groups and of course Iran backing these terror groups, Shiite, Sunni, all this together. Which calm? the Germans are talking about. Well, it's like a <laughs> baseball match in a China store, something like this. Uh, what, we, what we've seen is, you, you know, I'm, I'm studying now Iranian educational system, and, and they are really educating the people for the coming empire. It may be Islamist, it may be Persian, Cyrus the Great, all of that. Uh, they, they dream about empire. However, where, whatever country or place they touch breaks down. Unlike the British, you know, where they they took a country, they, they just added it to the empire. You mean the, the Iranian, Iranian? You mean the Iranians or the United States? Uh, sometimes <laughs> together. They, the, the U.S. Uh, broke Iraq, took took them eight years to rebuild Iraq. They gave it to the Iranians. They destroyed it again. 
Uh, same with Syria, same with Lebanon, with uh, three wars in, uh, with Hamas, another war in Lebanon. Uh, now Yemen, I, I'm, I'm sure they want uh, Mecca and Medina. W once they have Mecca and Medina, they, 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 they can start uh, building the empire seriously. They talk about Islamic awakening in, in Europe every other day. So, uh, but problem is, I don't see that they have any skills in running this. So they behave like a, a, a group of, um, you know, it, it, it's completely, you know, fa fact of the matter, Iranian diplomats speak good English, unlike Ahmadinejad, which shows that my mother was right, it's good to learn English. But apart from that, <laughs> they are not that civilized. You know, I'm, I'm trying to understand, from where do they get the money? If they are in economic sanctions, if uh, the situation in Iran is so bad, if they are isolated, from where is the money that they are allowing themselves to just spread on wars? Well, first of all, they don't have uh, that much money, especially after the drop of the prices of the oil. But they have enough. They have enough, not enough, to deal with all the, the big challenges that they face right now in the Middle East. But I guess to deal with them in the minimum way that they can right now. With Hezbollah, for example, they brought down the support for Hezbollah in the last decade, brought it dramatically. With Hamas right now, they don't really support Hamas. So yes, they need to support Hezbollah still, but not the way that they used to support a couple of years ago. They invest much in Yemen and, of course, in Iraq, because for them, Iraq wasn't still kind of a backyard that they need to take over again after it was taken from them. So if right now there is a deal and they will sign a deal, what does it mean? Does it mean that the sanction will be lifted some, and then some, sanctions some will be of the sanctions will be lifted and then they will have more money, more money that will help them maybe help Hezbollah, help Hamas exactly. and basic, basically run all over and the place. And this is what the Israelis are saying. How come that you're closing a deal here over only the nuclear issue without even talking about the other aspects of that, meaning terrorism, meaning taking over some states, supporting a jihadist groups, supporting terrorist groups? You cannot just ignore the rest of the reality. Okay, maybe you will slow them down with the nuclear project, but they will be completely free to go forward with what they do in the Middle East. And this is building an empire. And they're already right now an empire. I think that if we will look at the history books in 100 years, they will be talking at uh, the years of 2013, 14, 15, when the Iranian empire took over the Middle East. It's quite crazy to understand the changes. There's no more Lebanon, no more Iraq, no more Yemen, and instead of that, and no more Syria, of Syria. course. And instead of that, what we see is all kinds of uh, entities that are being controlled in some way or another by the Iranians. And some kind of entities that run, want to rule the, the, the world back, if it's Egypt, if it's uh, Saudi Arabia, if it's uh, each and every one of these, uh, let's say, mother nations that wants to take, gain the control back on the Muslim world or, in the, or on the Arab world. Well, the, the Arabs, we have to thank the Iranian, first of all, to bring back Arab unity. We see Ar Arab for the first time kind of uh, going back to the census and uh, starting to coordinate the policy and getting closer to Israel. So maybe if Iran continues this way, maybe we'll have peace in the Middle East finally. But uh, it's it's going to be a, a very very long a very very long uh, long process, a long ordeal. Uh, and uh, it may end up in a, in a civil war I I inside Iran. Iran may impl implode inside. It, it, there can be all kinds of, of, of scenarios. One of them is really that they will succeed building their empire and, you know, take over Mecca and Medina and then uh, spring forward. But uh, it's, it's, not, it's, not so, it's, not, it's not so simple. What the Iranians need really are like just like little children, they need limits and they, they need some boundaries. And I'm afraid that the U.S. doesn't give them any boundaries at all. There is no limits. There is no direction. There is no uh, compass. And uh, that's a problem. And, and you add to the mix the nuclear weapons and uh, because the system remains uh, basically intact. More centrifuges, less centrifuges. And nobody talked still about the ballistic missiles and nobody talks about all the military there was there was a piece in the Can new york times uh, uh, about all the many 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 aspects of uh, military experiments that were on there and nobody even talks about that you know we're in a kind of a time tunnel right now we're going back just like that the old show on tv with doug and tony but we're going back to 660 uh 
when uh, Muhammad died and uh, the big uh, war over who will be his successor started, Prophet Muhammad, of course. And we still see the same seeds of the war of uh, 680, if I'm not wrong. There yeah. was the, the big uh, fight of Karbala. Over there, still Shiites and Sunnis so, so. are killing each other and trying to take over and decide who is the successor of Prophet Muhammad. From, but from where do you start? You know, it's, it's another discussion, but from where do you start to bring these uh, two uh, fractions in the Muslim world back together? From where, when they're fighting the entire time, when they're seeing two different way of, ways of life, how, from where do you start bringing them together? Well, f first of all, uh, there must be some uh, some order. You had, you had a functioning country, Iraq, that was exporting oil, and had a democracy. The U.S. had to, to leave there, you know, just one division, two divisions, just to keep everything calm. No, they took, took it off. Uh, Syria, you had peaceful demonstrations. Okay, why don't you support them? Iranians uh, tell them, okay, go kill them. Okay, they kill them. You have now three, 200,000, 300,000, 10 million uh, refugees. So the, the, the question is to take a, a, a lot of small right decisions and we didn't, that are. That, we didn't that, that, even start talking about the objection of Turkey to this, or even is, where is Israel in all this mess? Because Israel is right in the middle, and the fall maybe of the ba boundaries or the limits between the borders between the countries puts Israel in a really problematic place. Israel is in the middle of the nuclear issue, but it's not in the middle of the fight between the Sunnis and the Shiites. It's completely irrelevant, and this is something that we need to understand. But until when you can stay out of it? I don't know. I'm not sure. But for the meanwhile, we're out of this. For the first time, for decades and decades, Israel is completely irrelevant for the real conflict in the Middle East. The real conflict today, it's not about Israel and the Palestinians. It's not about Israel and the, state, the, the Arab states. It's about the Sunnis against the Shiites. Yeah. That, but they, they'll get over it. They will get over it. I, I, you know, one more thing before we're finishing. Can Israel allow itself to stay on the fence? Regarding the, the Arab states, they don't have any other option. Regarding the nuclear issue, that's one million dollar question that you asked me. Why? Because Netanyahu, before the elections, was saying, we need to stop Iran, we need to stop Iran. Okay, you went to the Congress, you made your speech over there. It doesn't work. So now Obama continues, is going to get to this agreement. Now, what are you going to do? What are we going to I don't have the answer, Avi. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with me in this uh, stage. Let's hope that we will have uh, another studio in uh, <laughs> four days. Thank you very much. Two minutes and I'll be back. <laughs>The Iran nuclear talks go down to the wire. Reports emerge of a provincial agreement on key parts of a deal through Iranian diplomats denied. The Saudi Arabia-led coalition in a fourth night of airstrikes on Shiite rebels in Yemen, while in Egypt, a summit of Arab leaders confirms the attacks will continue until the rebels surrender. And France votes in a second round with ruling socialists set for a major setback and all eyes on the rise of the far right. Welcome back. It's the fourth day of a Saudi Arabia-led campaign in Yemen, an attempt to cut off supply lines to Shiite Houthis and drive them into surrender. And while the attacks continued in Yemen, in Egypt, Arab leaders, many of whom are invested in the Saudi fight, agreed on a joint military force. More from Charles Bublitzer. Amid growing regional turmoil, Sunni Arab countries are hoping that a unified force can have a stabilizing effect. As a Saudi-led coalition continues to strike Houthi strongholds in Yemen, Arab leaders announced their intention to form a joint army. A high-level team will be assembled under the supervision of the militaries of the member nations to study all relevant matters in order to create a united Arab force. The move is being viewed as a countermeasure to the rising influence of Shiite Iran, 
which through its proxies has gained a foothold in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq and Gaza. Arab leaders are adamant that the takeover of Yemen by Iranian-backed militias constitutes a red line. Arab mobilization was required as Yemen slid into chaos. This after we exhausted all peaceful solutions to end the coup and return the legitimate government. The mission will continue until the Houthis withdraw and hand over their weapons. The creation of such a joint military force could take months, with the stakes increasing daily due to war in Libya, in addition to the threat posed by the Islamic State. And with me right now in the studio is former Israeli ambassador to Egypt, uh, Itzhak Lebanon. Ambassador Lebanon, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Lucy. So, uh, you know, when it's a war, you cannot ignore that it's a war. So well, what Saudi Arabia is talking about, holding, sending troops, still needing to decide when it's already attacking Yemen? Well, look, uh, the war is like in the war. And this is what the Saudi started. It was a surprise, by the way. Uh, the surprise was the Saudi took this step. Uh, basically, you know, start hostilities against the Houthi. And secondly, they have succeeded in a very short time, relatively very short, uh, to have a coalition of uh, substantial Arab states, the Gulf states, Egypt, Jordan, even Pakistan, and even, you know, Turkey, uh, supporting uh, the Saudis in this uh, uh, activity. The Saudis are doing what the United States is failing to do. Definitely, yes. But we have to bear in mind that the Americans are helping the Saudis logistically and with the intelligence. You know, uh, they are giving, you know, the, the targets and the Saudis are pinpointing, you know, those targets. And this is how the Saudis have succeeded to destroy SCAD missiles, which are ballistic missiles. It's very important in this war. You know, I'm trying to understand, how come the, the United States is helping uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, it knows that uh, Iran is in this uh, war also, and on the other side is sitting with Iran on a round table and trying to reach an agreement? Lo Lausanne, Lausanne, Lausanne. <laughs> the Americans are very, they're aware that they would like to reach an understanding in Lausanne, and this is why they don't want to be in the forefront in Yemen. <coughs> Sorry, this is why they ask the Saudis to be, and they are extending to them, you know, the support, logistical support, and uh, and the intelligence. But look, we are only on the fourth day of this military operation, which so far has been, let's say, successful from the Saudis' point of view. We don't know yet what is going to be the uh, Shia, uh, the uh, Iranian reaction to that. I think that the Iranians will want. Uh, to wait, to wait until they will reach an agreement in Lausanne, which is in the coming 48 hours, to my assessment. They would like to go after the celebrations, uh, March the 31st, you know, of the Islamic Republic, etc. Yeah. And later on, we'll wait to see what will be the reaction of the Iranians. If they are going to continue supporting the Houthi and open, let's say, a war of guerrilla war inside Yemen, like in the 60s, in the last century, or they will say, OK, we understand, we are going to set, stand back, and we are leaving the, the, the Yemen to the Yemenites. This, we are going to wait and see what will be the Iranian reaction. Yeah, it seems that uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, showing the United States what is the slogan uh, that they are using, a lot, no boots on the ground. Yes. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for this. Thank you. And uh, the effect of the March 18th terror attack in Tunisia are still being uh, felt. Tens of thousands, along with world leaders, took to the streets of Tunis today, marching through the capital against terror. The attack on the Bardot Museum killed 21 people, mostly foreign tourists. Also today, Tunisia's Prime Minister Habib Essid announced the country's forces have killed the head of the jihadist group accused of organizing the massacre. And right now with me from Tunisia is uh, journalist Kiran Alvi. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us, Kiran. Thank you for having me. So um, we saw thousands of people rally today under the slogan Le Monde est Bardot or The World is Bardot. Reminds us of Charlie Hebdo, of course. Is this just a symbolic or is it really a sign of coming action? I think it's a sign of coming action. I mean, as you talked about earlier, uh, nine terrorists were just killed yesterday, uh, including one of the organizers of the museum attack. You had tens of thousands of Tunisians come out and show their support for 
you know, their country. It's an anti-terrorism rally. And I think the government is really going to step up its security efforts now to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. How much is the government affected by really the rise of terror uh, around the world? Was it uh, coming by surprise to Tunisia or is it something that the government expected? I mean, you can never say that the government, you know, expected such a big attack. Had they, I think they would have tried to address it better. But there have been, you know, problems and issues in certain border areas, in the mountains, um, close to Libya especially. Growing ISIS, you know, in Libya has also affected the security in Tunisia. However, something of this caliber definitely wasn't assumed. I think uh, it is a wake-up call for Tunisia that whatever security efforts they have been implementing really do need to be uh, increased because it is more open to threat than they might have assumed. How much they are, um, they are let's say, uh, speaking about the fact that uh, the Muslim world maybe needs, needs reforming and needs to start uh, rethinking about the way that it's educating their children, educating in schools, educating in the society. Is it something that they're taking under consideration in Tunisia? That's an interesting uh, question. I, I mean, nothing has been openly discussed so far in terms of changing education methods. However, I know there are certain members of parliament who have been saying that education needs to be the first priority in addressing uh, militants and addressing extremism, and that if people aren't educated um, in the more you know, impoverished areas of Tunisia, that they will be more susceptible to extremism. So I hope education is on the agenda, but there hasn't been much discussion of that so far here. Yes, Kiran Alvi, thank you very, very much for this conversation with us. Thank you. And now we're going to the disaster. More details have emerged on the horrifying last minutes on board the crashed German wings flight, including the pilots' frantic efforts to get back into the cockpit as the plane was plunging to its doom, killing all 150 people on board. Meanwhile, the gruesome task of recovery continues. More from I-24 News reporter Ayman Siksik. Open the damn door. These were likely the last words Andreas Lubitsch heard before sending the German wings flight slamming into the French Alps last week. They came from the captain, Patrick Sondheimer, in one last desperate plea to save the doomed plane. But Sondheimer would never receive a reply. French investigators are still struggling to explain Lubitsch's actions. I don't see a particular factor that could potentially explain his actions that would have been noticeable as far as I am aware. The inquiry will focus on understanding Lubitsch's environment. That will be very important. Initial transcripts from the cockpit voice recorder show that Sondheimer banged frantically on the cockpit door. At this point, alarms began to echo throughout the descending craft, followed by the screams of the terrified passengers. Meanwhile, the search continues across the crash site for the second black box from the craft. The importance of the last black box is in understanding the final technical elements of the aircraft, to find out what the aircraft's settings were, and to know what positive actions could have been carried out. Germany's Biel daily newspaper revealed over the weekend that Lubitsch had previously been in psychiatric treatment and more recently suffered from problems with his eyesight, potentially risking his career as a pilot. Lubitsch had also repeatedly asked his captain to be left alone in the cockpit. He is said by his previous partner to have been planning a big gesture for some time, reportedly saying, quote, one day everyone will know my name. A sixth gesture. France is voting today in a second round of local elections seen as a major test for the political map in 2017 when the next presidential elections will take place, the first round of the local elections, but uh, put Nicolas Sarkozy center-right on top and the far-right National Front just behind. Polls are predicting that Hollande's ruling Socialist Party could lose half the departments it now controls. And with me right now, now from Paris is international analyst Christian Mallard. Good evening, Christian. Good evening, Lucy. So, uh, Christian, let's put some order order into this um, so-called new government, new way of politics in Paris. What is happening right now? Or new old, maybe, politics in Paris? Well, the, the brand new thing tonight, we, we will get the result, the official results, 
or most of them, in 20 minutes from now. But the first figure we have got, it's interesting, it's the rate of participation to this vote, which is lower than the one of the first round by 1.5%. What does it mean? Who, the, 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 the left-wing party, the Socialist Party, and President Holland were definitely expecting with Prime Minister Valls to have a rebound from uh, the, the leftist uh, electorate. Uh, would have they gone? We don't know. Or would have we got a mobilization of the extreme right voters, of the Monsieur Sarkozy uh, right-wing traditional party voters? This is the key question we, we wonder right now. And the main question is, for the first time in French political history, will the National Front, which is the extreme right party, get the lead in two or three regions you know, of France, in the know. north, in the east and the south? You know, Christian, uh, we are trying to understand uh, after the elections in Israel what happened to the left in Israel and how come it was defeated the way that it was. How come is, it is happening in France as well? What did they do wrong? Well, which explains the race of the extreme right in France for many reasons. First, there is a huge frustration from a majority of the electorate. When do you think, Lucy, that people who are traditional left-wing voters, even extreme left voters and right-wing voters, are so fed up uh, with the government, with our political leaders, that they decide to go to the National Front to express their disarray, their frustration. And this is why the, the extreme right is really moving forward in this country. At the same time, as you alluded to it, we have so many problems with Muslim fundamentalist networks in France, and it's true that the extreme right has been the one who has been pointing, putting the fingers on this very sensitive problem. The only problem with the extreme right is that they have no European policy. When you hear Madame Le Pen saying we need to go out of the, the Europe, of, out of Europe, we need to stop the euro currency and get back to the French euro currency, I think it's, she is dreaming and it would be a nightmare for the French. But right now, uh, yeah. with the rate of unemployment which has been raising uh, two days ago by, uh, by 0.4%, uh, it's clear that we cannot really imagine that the left tonight uh, will be uh, taking the, the head out of the yeah. water. Yeah, maybe they have uh, two more years uh, to try and solve this. Uh, let's hope that the, somebody will gain from this. Uh, Christian Mallard, thank you very, very much for this. Thank you, Lucy. A four-month-old baby died over the weekend in Israel in a care facility for children of migrant workers and asylum seekers. Her death reportedly due to neglect marks the fourth such case in two months and the 14th in two years. Shahal Pellet reports on the appalling state of the children's sheds in Israel. The city of Tel Aviv is known as the vibrant, cheerful heart of Israel where cafes, music and entertainment meet and merge. But in southern Tel Aviv, almost an entirely different city, or perhaps even universe, silently exists. In this universe, some 4,000 children of illegal migrants who fled Africa in search of work, refuge or both are left almost completely unattended and neglected. We know of a phenomena of boarding school conditions. When the parents work outside of town, the children can stay a week sleeping in these conditions and the parents come only on weekends to pick them up. Usually up to two adults look after over 50 children for 12 hours a day, but sometimes the children, less than three years old, are left completely unattended, for example when the supervisor was ill. The workers here, she said, are hospital. These were the circumstances in which Eritrean Efrat Irulgum's short life ended. She was four months old when she died this weekend, but the news were hardly published and the phones remained silent. Efrat choked to death on a bottle left in her crib in one of the kindergartens, also known as children's sheds, and very few people cared. 
But Efrat is not alone. She's the fourth case of the death of an infant in the last couple of months and the 14th in the past several years. Thus far, the only organization which cares to report is Mesila, partially supported by the Tel Aviv municipality. It focuses on the well-being of the migrant community's children. They told us that it's temporary, that they'll take them out. This year, 1,000 children were born. Each year, another 1,000 children are born. And this is what we face. And we are facing this practically alone. As the State of Israel continues its ambiguous policy towards asylum seekers and migrant workers, thousands of their children are held in inhumane conditions against all international treaties and universal moral values. And when this is the state of affairs in almost all 80 facilities in South Tel Aviv, the next death is only a question of time. Yes, and I-24 News received the following response from the Economy Ministry of Israel, which is in charge of uh, supervising official care facilities. The said uh, facility is uh, not under the supervision of or responsibility of the econo Economy Ministry. In cases of reports of life-threatening facilities, an inspection takes place in first priority, and in cases of lack of cooperation, it results in a closure order on the place. In the case of the infant death last Friday. It happened in a facility unknown to the ministry as of today. A closure order has been produced by the police for 15 days and until finalizing the investigation. And with me is economy reporter for uh, the Jerusalem Post, Neve Ellis. Good Hello. evening. Hello. How are you? Usually the one who's telling us uh, uh, about books, it's uh, Ayman Siksik, but today you are coming and telling us about a book that is uh, rising a lot of uh, criticism. Yeah, absolutely. So today I'm telling you about an economy book. Uh, and what's interesting is that this is a book that came out last year, a Capital in the 21st Century, made a huge splash. And uh, what's happened now is that, do you have talkbacks on your website? I'm sure everyone knows talkbacks are sort of the, yeah. They are considered, you know, like the worst of the worst. People say terrible things there. Yeah, believe me, I know. So <laughs> a, a talkbackist on an economics blog actually has mounted the most uh, coherent defense or a critique of this book since it came out last year. The book by Tom Spaghetti came out last year, and it said, basically made a big splash by saying that capital was getting bigger returns than the general economy. What does that mean? The capitalists, the rich people, the people that own stocks and real estate and all of that, are just going to become wealthier and wealthier, which means that inequality over time is just going to get bigger. You know, basically it reminds us what is happening right now with undeveloped countries. Either you're what, uh, rich or poor. Mm -hmm. And even in the developed countries, and that's what's even scarier, that it's in the U.S. and Israel, certainly, mm -hmm. there's this very big inequality. So he had this vision that it was just going to get worse and worse. Now, this talkbackist turned out to be a 26-year-old graduate student named Matt Rungley from uh, MIT. And what he was saying was basically, no, I think your data was wrong because a lot of this return was actually coming from houses, from real estate. Um, so when we're looking at inequality, we shouldn't just be looking at the Wall Street financiers and all that. We should be looking at homeowners. And that has really big implications for policy because instead of just putting more taxes on capital and capital gains, which businesses obviously don't like, we have to think about maybe how to get more people to own homes because then they will be able to join the upper ranks. That sounds really familiar to me with what is <laughs> happening here in Israel. Any any comment from uh, the, the book uh, author? No, no, we're still, uh, well, there's a, a sort of back and forth going on and, uh, you know, they're, they're still sort of trying to debate, no, he misunderstood what I said, no, he misunderstood what I said, but uh, certainly it's getting a lot of attention around the international press. Uh, definitely getting uh, more and more attention, of course. Uh, we will see the outcome of this when books are making history. No. Not history, because it won't change anything. <laughs> Neve Ellis, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Israel's parliament, the Knesset, today unveiled the largest solar field of any parliament in the world. The I-24 News correspondent Uri Shapira took a look at the intriguing and positive project in Israel. Israel's parliament, the Knesset, is heating up, and not just because of the negotiations over the formation of the next government. Dozens attended a special launch in the building of the Green Knesset, a unique project that sees parliament's facilities switching to green energy. We are at the beginning of the initiative rather than at its end, but this is undoubtedly an important turning point in which we can look back with satisfaction at everything that has been done with great success. 
This is a significant move, not just financially, but also environmentally, since the Knesset will now boast the largest solar field of any parliament in the world. Uh, we have here uh, uh, 4,600 uh, square meters of uh, photovoltaic uh, um, panels. Israel is considered a solar energy pioneer. In the 1950s, an Israeli version of the solar water heating device swept the nation and was used in at least 30% of all homes. But today, Israel is way behind Western countries when it comes to green energy, with only 2% of energy produced in Israel considered green. For lawmaker Dov Hanin, one of the leading forces behind this project, the Knesset initiative is only the beginning. We started. We have quite few achievements, what we should, but we should go forward and achieve much more on green legislation here at the Knesset. 110 refugees from eastern Ukraine fled the ongoing conflict and arrived to another conflict-ridden region, Israel. Mayed Ben Uriel and Shachal Pelad have more on their journey and arrival. The welcoming committee is ready. In a few minutes, 110 refugees from eastern Ukraine will cross this gate to become new Israeli citizens. The operation was led by the Karen Lee Dut Association, a private organization aiming to support diaspora Jews and persuade them to immigrate to Israel. <laughs> We visited various refugee camps and communities, looking for those who were forced out of their homes. We brought them to Kiev with their belongings. Yesterday evening, we traveled with them to here. Now, they should come out at any moment. Most of these new immigrants had to leave the city of Donetsk over the past few months. For over a year, this eastern Ukraine city has been at the heart of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. The situation is extremely harsh in Ukraine. I heard this association helps Jews to immigrate to Israel and helps them integrate. These people are traumatized. Liora has lived in Israel for 15 years, but her family has lived in Donetsk until a few weeks ago. In early February, a mortar shell hit the family house. Anna, Liora's aunt, was killed. After a long wait, Liora is finally reunited with her family. They look exhausted, both from the journey and from the never-ending civil war. We thought we wouldn't make it, but we received a lot of help. My sister was killed on February 10th, and on the 22nd, we left Donetsk to Denny Propertrovsk. We lived in nice conditions there, with accommodation, food, money, and our passports were ready. For these 110 immigrants who fled one conflict for another, Israel offers them a second chance. Before you will wish it on my face, now to sports. And with me is the host of the i24 News Sports Magazine, Jonathan Regev. Wish to my face. <laughs> Wish to my face. Wish to my we face. Are, we decided that we are going to invent <laughs> yes. words each and every time that yes. we are here. Like uh, Fargination like last Fargination. time. And wish <laughs> from the sound of the wish of yes. the sports. So, but from we didn't, wish. even for the last 30 seconds, we didn't speak of it, even about sports. Let's start speaking. Yes, I was uh, many interesting qualifiers, uh, Euro 2016 over the weekend. I was hoping to speak about football. I was even willing to speak about the Israeli team's appalling performance <laughs> last night. But we have... Told you so. Yes, 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 you did. I was optimistic. What can I do? But we have to speak about fan violence again, this time in Montenegro. The match between Montenegro and Russia suspended after 65 minutes. It only took 18 seconds for a firecracker from the stand to land on the head of the Russian goalkeeper. Oh my the God. game was stopped for about a half hour, then it was renewed, then fighting took place with, with the fans throwing more objects, and it was stopped. It's the third time in these qualifiers that games uh, were stopped, were suspended, all three games involving fans from ex-Yugoslavia nations. It happened with Serbia, it happened with Croatia, now with Montenegro. What does that mean? I, it, it, does it start to look like a pattern? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say yes. 
It does. If it happened three times with ex-Yugoslav countries, something may be wrong. Be exciting sports in these countries, but a lot of corruption, violence, and, and we're seeing so now it it's to in the international end, uh, level. To uh, this, uh, but let's uh, talk about Mercedes and Formula One. Formula One, Malaysian Grand Prix today, and if anyone thought uh, uh, Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton will once again dominate the circuit, no, sir. There we see him, Sebastian Vettel, celebrating, crossing the line. He won four the the championship four times for Red Bull. Now he he moved to Ferrari, and with this win. Uh, Sebastian Vettel and Ferrari are giving a big signal to Mercedes. This time we're going to put up a fight, especially with uh, uh, someone like Sebastian Vettel who knows a thing or two about winning the Formula One. A very, very exciting season begins. If this is what happens in the second race of the season, a lot you know, to look for in the season. You know what I love about this sport? What it Ends fast. Yes, <laughs> yes, they do drive fast. They do drive fast. Uh, but again, it's not a real sport. Like, uh, it's extreme. Uh, it's many fun. people will, uh, will argue that, but... <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, let's <laughs> talk about true. Iran. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that name in this edition, didn't you? Yes, I did. So, so you about a deal. Yes, yeah, so, so we'll speak about something else. <laughs> Beach football. Iran is one of the best nations in Asia in the sport. They um, uh, here competed against Lebanon in the, th uh, the competition, the, the game for the third place, which would guarantee the winner here a place in the World Cup next, uh, next summer. Iran won it. Apparently, Iran is one of the best countries in the world. Sixth, yeah. they're ranked, ranked sixth in the world in beach football, and they will play next summer after they beat Lebanon in the play game for the third place. They will play in the World Cup next summer in Portugal. Well, well, this is a good point that we can say to Benjamin Netanyahu about lifting off the sanctions. Yes, well, the, they may have nuclear weapons, but they can play but beach can football. Play beach yes. Yeah. Yeah. Think about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just. <laughs> yeah, it is funny. But. <laughs> Jonathan Rugged, thank you very much. Uh, you, we're Mr. going out for a small break, two minutes, and I'll be back for more, <laughs> much more.